Hello and welcome to the session. Hope you guys are having a good time today. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Leonard O'Sullivan. This is my colleague, Daniel Caldwell. Uh, we work for an organization called XVT Solutions based out of Brisbane in Australia. XVT does a lot of dot network, but also a lot of Drupal dev work. Obviously, all the fun stuff happens on the Drupal side. Um, I work in the Drupal dev team. Daniel works in infrastructure, and obviously the teams collaborate quite a bit across different projects. Um, and today we want to talk about a Drupal 8 project that we're working on and some of the performance and caching issues we ran into and some of the solutions we found for them. <coughs> Excuse me. So to start off, um, can I just get a show of hands of people in the room who have, either they work in infrastructure themselves or someone in their team is tasked with managing infrastructure like AWS or Azure or Google or something like that. All right, so we've got a few. Um, all right, cool. So you guys might get a little bit more out of this session. Um, obviously, if you're using like Acquia or Pass, something like that, you might be insulated from a lot of this stuff. Um, but yeah, hopefully I'll get something out of it as well. So, start with a controversial statement. Drupal 8 is slow. Well, it can be. Uh, we found that under certain circumstances, under certain loads, when we were trying to get Drupal to do certain things, it was becoming incredibly slow. But the upside is we have the Drupal 8 caching system which is really powerful, really accessible. I found it really easy to work with. I found it really easy to develop for. Um, so we've got a lot of power there. Just out of the box, you might not be, if you just install Drupal out of the box, you're not going to see a lot of the advantages that are available to you. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm coming down with a bit of a cold, so I have a bit of a cough, so I just want to apologize for that. So yeah, just what we found, just out of the box, the image on the left here is Drupal standard, install it, chuck an RDS in the back. We have it in an auto-scaling group spinning up to 20 or 30 different instances at a time. Zero caching config. We didn't even bother worrying about it and we're getting 5,000 millisecond response times. A lot of that time spent in the database. Obviously not good. And on the right here, um, we have what we were aiming to get to, 200 millisecond response time, um, where there are no bottlenecks, the application scales with load, and there are no spikes. It's just 200 milliseconds across the board. So are there some, do we think that there's some configurations that you can, that are like hard and fast rules that you can apply across the board? Yes, yes there are actually, but I guess we need to go back to the start, talk a bit about our application and where we started our journey. Excuse me, so obviously the Drupal 8 application, we're building for a state government department in Australia. And essentially what we're doing is we're digitizing the planning permission application process. So if you can imagine applying for planning permission, it's laborious. There's lots of forms you've got to fill in, paper forms. You've got to submit it to your local council. This state in question had over 150 different local councils. So everything's in paper. You've got to submit it to your local council. Then they've got to kind of digitize some of that stuff and get it onto like a shared system. What we're trying to do is take a lot of that uh, manual paperwork out of the system, create these like dynamic multi-step web forms. A member of the public wants to build an extension in their house, they can go to the website, fill in these forms. They could put in their address and find out what kind of zoning permits are, are applicable to their address, all this kind of magic. Um, but as we started developing it, we realized that these are huge forms. We're talking hundreds of different fields across different forms, dynamic forms. So the information you enter early on in the, in the steps um, can dramatically affect the questions that you're asked later on. So actually, these were actually taking quite a lot of processing power um, to handle. Um, from a Drupal perspective, how we decided to architect this, we essentially took a node and a web form and smashed them together. So we've got a node content type that references a web form submission. In hindsight, we probably, if we were to build this again, we probably would have looked at custom entities across the board, but time constraints, we wanted to get an MVP out the door. So got a node referencing a web form. The benefits of node, obviously you've got ownership over the node, you've, you've got um, authored on date, all this kind of magic, you're able to reference files from there. And then but web form was also really powerful. You can add 20 or 30 fields to a web form, but that's not gonna blow it out your database by another 20 or 30 tables. So kind of, you're trying to use the best of both worlds here. Uh, and in the image here, you can see a user comes to the site, they're, um, filling in different multi-step forms, step one, step two, step three. Step two there is a web form questionnaire, but it, it's seamless to the user. They're just filling in forms. Um, 
All right, cool. So, what happened when we started? Um, okay. Sorry, I got a bit ahead of myself. So the performance expectations from the client were, this doesn't seem like a lot, 800 users over a 24 hour period. So it's constant 800 users, they're active users on the site, they're filling in forms, submitting lots of submissions to the database. So we're looking at hundreds of form submissions per minute at peak. And like I mentioned already, heavy forms, lots of fields. So how did we prepare ourselves to be able to handle this load test? Well, we use Gatling submissions. And there's another colleague of ours, Hacks and Sim, Hacks and Kim, unfortunately, he can't be here with us today, but he um, is a performance engineer. We got him on board to write these Gatling simulations. So Gatling is this awesome tool where you can write these simulations in, in Java, and you're simulating real traffic to your website. We found them to be really accurate and really good at pushing, the, pushing our infrastructure really hard so we could find out where our bottlenecks were, find out where our issues were, and try and solve them before we moved to a production environment. Um, so, yeah. Gatling simulations, Hackson wrote them, we unleashed it on, the, on our infrastructure, and what happened? Well, the database exploded. Everything was on fire. Uh, and this, this, this hedgehog is our dev team running away from uh, a burning database. Why well, hedgehogs, I'm not really sure, but we've got to think for hedgehogs at the moment at XVT. So this was happening pretty early on, right? 60 consecutive users, and we were getting 15 second response time for some pages. So that's pretty awful, you know? Um, so what do we do? We started looking at basic stuff, like looking at SQL, looking in real time at the SQL queries that are running against the RDS and trying to find stuff that sticks out as being, um, you know, really problematic. I did look at using the web profiler for a while, um, but I found that I wasn't getting the full picture there. I wasn't seeing every single query that was being run against the database to generate a specific page, or I think it was between pages when you're submitting a form, we were kind of missing out on some stuff there. Um, so obviously slow, slow queries, what did we do? Uh, we started investigating um, our SQL logs. And what did we find? Well, initially we found some really, really bad stuff. Like I said, we were rushing to get an MVP out the door. Early on in the piece, um, we decided that we needed to have a hidden field on our node form. And that form would be a reference field to our form submissions. And we would do some jiggery-pokery, get a web form submission, create one, get the ID, and pre-fill this field on the form. It's a really, really hacky, horrible idea, but early on, we, it was just to get everything working, we put it in there. Later on, we removed that functionality, but we left the hidden field on the page. So what we were doing is we were scaling up with our simulations. Everything would go good for an hour or two, and then all of a sudden, the database usage would spike and everything would start to fall over. And we found that what was happening was, after a couple of hours, there, were, there had been so many submissions already lodged into the database that this field, this hidden field on the form, was a select list that was trying to load 60,000 options into, <laughs> into the list, and obviously your database was falling over. That was, that was pretty awful. So we solved this problem, and you know, we thought, that's it. You know, everything's going to be great now, but it wasn't. So looking a bit closer, we were looking at the web form module. We were really heavily invested in web form at this stage. Uh, we'd re written a, a couple of custom plugins that would allow our client to generate, generate dynamic fields. Um, that influenced each other. So it, we did some cool stuff. We didn't want to lose out on that functionality. Um, so we looked at the Web4 module and how the Web4 module was using key value store in Drupal. So what was happening was for every new Web4 entity that you create or Web4 config that you create, it would add an ex-serial ex -serial entry in the key value table. And when you wanted to create a submission against that form, it would say, oh, well, what's the next serial? I want to enumerate these forms, go one, two, three, four. What's the next number? It would read that next serial and then update it as part of a database transaction. But we found that this transaction was a bit inefficient. Um, it was using like a max against what could be hundreds of thousands of submissions on a table. So that was taking a little bit of time. And these transactions were stacking, so it would block all the, all the other submissions that were coming in, and then the next one would block. And like I said, we're scaling up to 30 instances. They're all trying to submit web form submissions. And then we have this transaction that's blocking. So obviously, that's bad. We had to do something about it. So what we decided to do at the time was create a patch for the web form module. So got on the issue queue, created a patch. And essentially, all the patch does is provides a checkbox on your config page that says, I don't want to enumerate these forms. I don't care if, if they're out of order. I, I just want to have forms that a form that you can submit to. And we were able to remove this bottleneck. Um, unfortunately, the patch hasn't made it in 
to the dev release yet. It's kind of sitting on the issue queue. I guess it's kind of specific to our use case, but maybe someone else can get some value out of it. Um, I thought it was interesting as well that the key value table is pinned to the database right now. I think a lot of developers, when you think of key value, you might think of something like Redis, um, like a fast way of, of setting and reading um, keys and values, but right now in Drupal 8, a uh, key value is stuck in the database. You can't actually put that anywhere else right now. So I think maybe a key value cache bin is something that will be interesting to look at in the future. So we made all these changes, resolved most of our glaring SQL issues, and then the Drupal case started to fall over. So um, I guess we, at this point we hadn't put any real effort into configuring the Drupal case outside of the standard. So Everything is still getting sent to the database. Um, so yeah, after we took out our, our most obvious bottlenecks, we had to move on and you know get a bit smarter about cache. So we found the chain fast backend, which is pretty cool. It's a cache backend that's part of core. So just to give you a brief rundown of how cache bins and backends work in Drupal 8. So a bin kind of defines the type of data that's being saved. So you've got a render bin, a container bin for the service container, a menu bin, a toolbar bin, and that is kind of a configuration where you define the type of data that's going to be cached. And then the backends are all services. So there's a database backend, an APCU backend, chain fast backend, and the services basically take the data and put it somewhere. Or it allows you to retrieve the data from that bin. Sorry, from that backend, from that location. Um, but the thing about chain fast backend, which makes it really cool, is that you can take um, two backends and chain them together. So you can use a, an in-front in-memory cache like APCU that sits on your Drupal instance and you can back that with a, with a database backend for example. So um, if a request comes in to an instance it will look in its APCU local in-memory cache for that item. If it can't find it, it will go to the database, retrieve it and then store it locally for any subsequent requests. So you kind of get the, the benefit of having a local in-memory cache that's fast and then you get the benefit of a shared cache backend where you can share stuff across all of your instances. Um, so yeah, look, found ch chain fast backend, thought it was gonna solve all of our problems. I think something, good, something important to note here as well is that APCU is not opcode, so we're, it's not tasked with compressing and optimizing your PHP code, it's actually storing data. So this is just a look at our chain fast backend configuration at the time. You would just chuck this in your settings.php file, um, for example. You set the default backend to database, and then we set just set everything to chain fast. Like we were just experimenting at this point in time and seeing what worked and what didn't work. And, and this is what our setup looked like. So how do we fare with chain fast? Well, performance was better, but we found after a while of running the simulations, we'd get you know lots of spikes in the database again. We're still putting a lot of pressure in the database. And it was only at then, only then that we found out that. Um, when a request comes through to an instance, it will check APCU locally for that cached item. And even if it does find it, it says, hey, well, is this a stale item or is it fresh? So then it does a round trip to the database to see, hey, have you got a newer version of this item? So even if it doesn't have a newer version, there's still a round trip to the database. And we're doing lots of scaling out. So you still have 30 instances all making requests to the database. They're not retrieving data every time, but they're still checking. And they check against the last right timestamp for that cached item. So Chainfest is really cool, really powerful, but for us, you know, it wasn't really working well. Um, so enter Redis. So what is Redis? Just a brief rundown for anyone who's not familiar. It's an in-memory high-performance key value store, and the Drupal caching system is essentially a key value store. You've got your cache ID or your CID is the key, and then you've got a value associated with that. So obviously Redis is a really great place to, to put Drupal cache stuff. Um, just a brief mention of Redis versus Memcache. I know Memcache is quite popular as well. Um, why did we choose Redis? I think we looked at the Redis, the Drupal 8 Redis module, and it seemed to be a bit more popular at the time. A um, few more, a bit higher usage. The issue queue seemed to be a bit more active. So we thought, look, this seems to be more popular. It seems to be the way people are going. So let's go with Redis. So we spun up AWS uh, Alexa to Cache instance with Redis, version two or three, I can't even remember. Um, at this point, we're still using Chainfast, but we've just changed the back end to be Redis instead of the database. So how do we do with Redis? Good and bad. Um, so if you look at this, 
diagram here, we're still spending about four seconds in Redis for some for some requests. So this is a Redis hget all, um, and this is a look uh, in um, New Relic of, of what we were looking at when we were looking at our, our stack trace. Um, and this this four seconds Redis hget all actually was a bit of a problem for us because the Drupal 8 Redis module relies on a local um, PHP extension being installed called PHP Redis. PHP Redis isn't actually written in PHP, it's written in C. So we're using New Relic to try and trace to see where we're spending all these times in different functions and we would get to the, the Redis stuff and we'd just be completely blind. We don't know what's happening. We know that it's taken four or five seconds, but we don't know what it's doing in that time. Um, at the time, and I think it's still true right now, New Relic doesn't have a C agent, so we weren't able to see what was happening in there. So we did a bit more looking, looking closer at the Redis module, and we saw that the Drupal 7 version of the module supported PHP Redis and also a library called Predis. Predis was written in PHP, so we thought, well, it's not that much of a stretch for us to put a patch in and try and get Predis supported for Drupal 8. So we did that. We want to give a big thanks to Birder, the maintainer of the Drupal 8 Redis module. He really helped us a lot to get this, to get our patch merged in, and it's now part of the RC2 release. So Redis module now, Redis version 8 module now supports PHP Redis and Predis. Um, so that's great. We had a bit more visibility across our stack, and we also it also opened the door to have read replicas, which is something that you can use. Um, which is a feature of Redis, which allows you to have uh, a primary where you do all of your Redis cache writes, and then the writes are reflected across a number of replicas. But when you get a read in, a read can come from any of these replicas. The writes all go to the primary, but you can read from any of the replicas, which is pretty cool. And it was quite, it's quite easy to set that up with Predis. Um, so I think we just amended the patch a bit better to allow that to happen with Drupal 8. Um, yeah, and Daniel wanted me to mention also that when we are now reading from Redis, it goes to um, or root 53 DNS round robin. So that means we can just scale horizontally and keep adding new read replicas. And Drupal doesn't even have to know about them. A request will come in and a round robin read will go to one of the read replicas. And we can just scale horizontally with that and keep costs down. So we sw switched out PHP Redis for Predis. Um, and yeah, we started doing a few more tests. This is just a brief rundown of PHP Redis versus Predis. I think at this stage I'll hand over to Daniel. He's a bit more of a Redis expert, so he'll, he can move on from here. Okay, so when we first um, start experimenting with PHP Redis and um, Predis, so I called it, you know, Predis thing, it, it supports slaves. Put them in, but it wasn't really happy with the performance. So, I mean, the first thing you do, well, maybe it's not, not big enough, fast enough, or, you know, throw a bit of money at the problem, make it bigger. It was still not performing. And as we dug in, we saw, hang on, well, the reads weren't actually getting any, any, any usage. So we dug in a little bit further because, you know, everyone else recommended Redis because it doesn't make that it's slow. So we just kept looking. So as we're digging through some old tickets, this case, old ticket, I uh, believe was seven years old, Small little comment saying, by the way, if you're using um, Redis, it, no, it does a nice, it's all test between your reads, but as soon as you hit the first write, everything afterwards will stay on the primary. So if whatever you're doing is in your request, by chance you have a little thing, something that you update in the beginning, even if you have a whole bunch of heavy operations after that, it will still hit the primary. So you're not really um, scaling. So it wasn't really a Redis problem, it's more so kind of how we're using it. So at that point, we needed to dig in and see actually what was happening, what were the requests that were going through and it was causing problems. So using the Redis CLI monitor to really see exactly what was coming in and to which backend um, were being um, passed off. And yeah, so at that part, we discovered you know, that we were seeing exactly that same problem where we're hitting a write fairly early on and well, we had to figure something. So the next thing we, we sort of discovered that all these writes were kind of you know, always the same type, same cache bin. And it was always the, the rendering, the render cache and the dynamic page cache. So well, hang on, I think think, rendering HTML stuff, does that really need to be in a distributed memory grid? I mean, Drupal is already pretty quick at rendering HTML. It does not need to be distributed. So I thought, well, let's just keep that local and only use Redis for the bigger, more expensive operations. And basically as soon as, and that, 
effectively removed all these early writes. And now, this is what it looks like. So now basically we have our default, it still read this, but now we've for, we're forcing all the, the page rendering and some other bits and pieces into just the local APC cache and everything else just stays with chain fast. Um, you, know, you might have noticed at our chart that, that the actual you know, response was actually lower than the, you know, the accumulative you know, request times. We've been trying to dig in to you know, determine what that is. It's a bit weird because you know, Reddit is single-threaded, PHP is single-threaded, so somewhere in there it does some sort of concurrency because that is as per new value is what it says. If, you, if your total or your actual is lower than your total, you're having you have some sort of concurrency or async stuff happening. We, we think it might be um, due to the um, high Redis library underneath it, but we're not entirely sure. Also, we haven't had you know, the time to dig any further. Um, other than that, we hope we got decent performance and you know, the load was all nicely spread across the different um, layers, caching, database, code, and everyone's happy. Um, so yeah, it, the, end, the, the cache system is very powerful and we only sort of touched the surface of what you can do with it. You might have special um, use cases where you might want to tweak it even further. But these are some basic guards that you can use and already making those changes, your whole thing should just go faster. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. I think um, it was just it was counterintuitive to me to say, well, we're going to render all this, inf we're going to render all this stuff, but we're not going to share it across our instances. We're just going to store it locally. But for us, it just boosted performance dramatically. So, scaling up to 30 instances, a request comes into one instance to retrieve a page. It has to render it. If a request comes in a second later to a different instance, it has to re-render it. So, like it seems to be like highly inefficient. But we saw that PHP usage on the instances went up slightly, but then stayed steady. So we're just as long as our architecture scales with load and everything stays steady, there's no spikes, no bottlenecks. Well, that's kind of that's what we determine as success. But yeah, and we were a bit worried about using APCU that you know load in memory, but because we're only putting the rendering cache in, it's not that much. If we put you know big data stuff in there, we have a bit of a problem. But this way, you know, the actual APCU cache uses remain fairly low, and we were pretty happy to shove them to production. Yep. Cool. That's it. Um, I think there is another presentation now, a short one, for 10 minutes that's scheduled, and then there's question time at the end of both. Um, I'm just not sure if uh, is Alex not here. I haven't seen him. I haven't seen him today either. It doesn't seem to have checked in, so you're good on time. All right, well, <laughs> yeah, if you have any questions, um, yeah, we kind of rushed through it because we didn't think we'd have enough time, but yeah, if you have any questions. Yes, over there. Can you just go back like the last generation page? Yep. Yeah, so I think the only thing that's a bit different than what you would normally have is the dynamic page cache and render cache ending up in APCU. Um, yeah, traditionally that render stuff would get shared across all the instances, but we're just just share, just using it locally. Um, never get shared. So that was kind of a bit of a that was that came as a bit of a shock to me. I didn't expect that at all. Uh, that's not something else we've tried because initially we figured well, we want to stay with the hardware that we already had in place, um, and that's what we still have. Where everything was backed by the database, so you know, being DevOps, well, let's just you know start looking at the database first. And we did find a few things that we could tweak. Um, being Postgres, you know, you could make certain like if it's a cache table, you figure well, there's no point of having of keeping all your your wall logging, so you make those tables unlocked, and that did help a little bit. Um, but at the end, you know. The over effect wasn't there. So, sorry, go back over there. Yes, um, a lot of it seems to come down to the cache bins themselves. In Drupal 8, there seems to be a large number of them. Mm -hmm. Did you have to use a large amount of Drupal 8 insight and secret knowledge, or was there a large amount of trial and error to come up with this I cache this, <laughs> cache that, cache this, and this level? Yeah, I think it was a lot of brute force, a lot of, well, let's try this one here, let's try that one there. We did a lot of playing around with things. When you look back, it was quite silly. I think we had our APCU memory set to a gig at one stage and the TTL set to an hour. So we were trying lots of crazy stuff. A lot, I th a lot, of, a lot of trial and error, I think. Like this is, I don't know, seven months ago now. Like the documentation is good for Drupal 8, but I guess, um, I don't know, a lot of the other information outside how a cache bin or a cache backend works wasn't there, or, you know, there's no real recommendations 
um, and we found that just out of the box, everything everything chucked in the database is obviously you know not not a great idea. Um, um, but and, yeah, and luckily for us, we had hacks available who would you know be working on this the entire time, and he would just run one Gatling simulation after another because everything is um, Ansible controlled. You know, make changes, throw up a new environment, push it out, and just keep hammering it day and night with tests. Yeah, so we're lucky to have Haxon, and yeah, we probably tried three different configurations a day, different simulations, just to try and get through it. And as part of that, we actually, something else we did discover, which is not really a um, duple thing itself, but, you know, other pieces of cases you can put in front of your system. In our case, it was CloudFront. Once again, we used to hang on, all these resu results are coming back, and, you know, they weren't actually being, there was no cache hits. So once again, you know, go into, go into your CDNs, make sure that you know, all the requests to, to a site or themes or whatever it is, you know, make sure that you strip out all, all these sort of good parameters so that cloud um, really sort of enforces those being cached. Yeah. Yep, down the back. Um, we did try that, it was horrible. Can you, can you the so, uh, if, um, the question was whether there was a, um, a file based cache backend, is that right? Uh, yes, there is, and we did try that originally, but it was. Uh, there, there is a PHP file backend that's only really um, useful for specific bins. So, I think like the service container bin would, you could like, it would be compressed PHP files that sit in your files directory. Um, but file-based backend, we I don't think we tried. Well, like we a, did try, but we had we end up with massive um, I/O and the instance. Okay. Um, there's actually another one because there's the the pure. I think it was a memory backend. There's just all the requests, and that was kind of hang on memory. You think you know system memory, but it's not. It's actually just your request memory. So it was only caching for the duration of your request rather than across requests on the same instance. Yeah, my, uh, So the, yeah. so the question is whether we could use a um, tempfs to m uh, make that a bit faster. We did not explore that option, but you know, at the end, everyone likes Redis. We figure, I mean, people are using it for a reason, so we figured let's try and let's, let's make sure we actually use it correctly. And uh, so we only had a few tests with with file in general, and because the performance was so bad that we didn't really consider even tr wanting to try to um, tune it. Any other question? Oh, sorry, yes, over here. Do you think that the, the chain technique, is that something that might get in core at some stage, or is it, is it really weird? The chain fast backend is part of core right now, and it's really, it's really cool, it's really powerful, um, and you can turn it on, and by default, it will check to see if APCU is installed on the machine, and it will just automatically use APCU in the database, so it's really <coughs> quick and easy config. And you can use that straight away, and you will you will definitely get some uh, performance boost by just turning it on, or just setting your bins to use chain fast. Um, I think... There's some bins that recommend not to put in there, like container, discovery, and bootstrap. But we found problems with putting our container in APCU, and it really affected our performance. So we, we've got it in Chainfast now, um, which seems to be more, more performant for our particular stack, which was something else that was a bit counterintuitive, you know. Um, from It's a different to what they recommend to, that you use. Okay. Is that another one over there? Um, I, like, but these changes kind of um, affect our in, entire stack, like uh, the the entire website. So, um, yeah, I'm not nothing specific for the admin side, but the, like these changes that we have in place, um, you know, they they work like with the dynamic page ca page cache, for, for example. That is stuff that really comes into effect when a user is logged in. Um, and you know you're rendering you're you're rendering little bits of the page and, and caching them. Um, so these changes will boost performance for both logged in users and anonymous users. But yeah, we haven't done anything specifically for for the logged in user. So that was for the admin, but also see this other bin down here, Weave. That's a sort of a custom module, um, and that is a that's actually a, a backend calling a, an API, which is very expensive. 
protocol and, and slow. So what you want to make sure, and it produces a huge amount, humongous amount of um, JSON. So you want to make sure that that was fast and, and, and shared across all instances. So yes, it is not just um, for front end stuff. Anything else over there? I, I think that if you're going to use Chainfast, um, like if I was, if we were to start a new Drupal A project tomorrow using Chainfast, I would put the render cache in APCU again. If you're using auto scaling on AWS like we are, I would just put it there automatically straight away. Um, I'm not sure if it, yeah, I, th I think it's pretty safe to say that that sharing of those, of that render, of that markup, um, and those early writes to Redis were just ruining like our auto scaling with Redis. Like we're, or I think our read replicas were like five percent utilization each, and the primary was like ninety percent utilization. And you know, you're looking back at that you're scaling vertically with one instance. It's it didn't really suit us. Um, but yeah, it depends on the kind of scale and, and how much you think you're going to get your Redis instance is going to get used. If you only have the one Redis instance and you're not pushing it too hard, maybe it's okay to um, chuck the render caches in there. Well, it's, it's actually a Drupal thing. So Drupal is saying, hey, you're requesting this page. They're first of all checking to see if there is some rendered markup in, like, um, cached already. And it says, oh, no, it's not cached. Well, I need to render this page and cache it immediately. And so it's doing a render and write. So it's doing a few reads at the beginning, checking for render stuff, rendering, and then writing. And then it's doing a whole, whole lot of reads after that. And it kind of makes sense to do it like that, you know? The, the decision of the uh, caching system to uh, after, after a write to only use the master. Well, what yeah. Is, is, that, that, is, that, is that internal to Redis? Or that it's, it's, or, yes, I mean, the, 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 was it the person, um, developer made the decision, and to us it makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you think of the same in, in database or your, your two-phase um, locking, well, you want to do as little locking as possible. You do all your, your shared locks first, and only then you apply for your exclusive lock. So it's because you don't, yeah, you don't block anything. If you start hitting the master and early on, we eat foxy performance. I guess the thinking is if you if you're writing to the master and then you do a read directly to one of the replicas, well, you might be getting stale data that's just been written to the replica. It hasn't ha doesn't have time to replicate across. So it does make sense to to stop that lag. Um, because I think also Redis does not necessarily guarantee that all your replicas are up to date. Maybe slightly, that's slightly behind. Well, that's it. Unless there's any more questions, I think. Sorry. So what's that? <laughs> any hedgehogs? <laughs> oh, right, yeah. uh, no hedgehogs have been harmed. That, that there was a cushion behind the treadmill, so I just fell in a nice soft cushion. So. <laughs>